let's assume that we have a patient, we've made the diagnosis of myelodysplastic syndrome. Rami, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the revised international prognostic scoring system and how you use that in determining prognosis and treatment options. Sure, absolutely. So I think, as you mentioned, once we establish a diagnosis, the next step is usually what I call risk stratification or staging, which is something we apply to all, you know, the hematology or medical oncology diseases because the risk stratification provides two things. One, obviously, information for the patient and the family about the prognosis and the, you know, estimated the outcome of the patients. But then what we've used it mostly in MDS is really to tailor the therapy accordingly because we want to estimate the risk of the disease to justify a risk of a procedure such as allogeneic stem cell transplant. So historically, the IPSS had been the gold standard, which depends on the presence of cytopenias, the blast percentage, and the cytogenetics. And it, it serves pretty well. It really can identify patients that are higher risk, uh, but it has some obviously you know, short, uh, shortages in like addressing lower risk patients that could have higher risk features a little bit. So uh, as we learn more about this, there had been proposal for the revision, the IPSSR. So it allows a little bit more weight on the depth of the cytopenia. So if a patient has platelets of 10, we know all clinically that they don't do well as patients have platelets of 90. They were treated equally in the IPSS. So now the revised IPSS gives some weight. I think one of the more important changes also, like we learn more about the depth of the cytogenetics in, in those diseases. So the revised IPSS has a little bit more detailed cytogenetic groups. We learned, for example, something like monosomy 7 is worse than deletion 7. We, lo we learned about some you know, entities that are rare to occur but may have favorable prognosis. So I think, and, and several groups had already validated the revised IPSS that it's really better tool, you know, determining prognosis. Uh, it, it now puts patients in one out of five categories than four. So there is low or very low, low, intermediate, high, and very high. So the question always comes what to do with this intermediate group. And I think there are other things you weigh on on how to decide on treating that group. But there is no doubt that I think it, it refines the prognosis for the revised IPSS. There are several other models that are there. The WPSS, which is mostly used in Europe, had not been used much in the United States because it weighs heavily on the WHO classification in, in giving points on the system. And many times that information is lacking. And I think with all the other things, it doesn't account for many items of the disease. Uh, there is the MD Anderson models, which actually are pretty predictive for outcome. Uh, as you well know, we looked at the MDS consortium, at, at those models, uh, and many of those newer models definitely refine the prognostic value of the IPSS. And it's interesting because like what we think is lower risk disease, if we look at those patients, still around 25% of those patients will unfortunately die from disease or its complication within two years. Not always a AML transformation, um, but also it could be disease-related complications. Uh, so definitely those models can identify those patients that we always thought are lower risk, could have higher risk features. Uh, the question now, how do we translate that to treatment? It's probably not as yet clear like when to pull trigger on a procedure like allogeneic stem cell transplant if you upstage those patients by the new models. So is the IPSSR valid in patients who are about to be treated? Because it was developed based on uh, over 8,000 patients collected internationally, but none of those patients received any therapy. So does it work if I have a, a patient who's coming in and I'm not planning any type of therapy and, and, and just gonna follow that person with watchful waiting, uh, then that's probably a, a valid system for a prognosis. But what about if I have a patient who comes in and I'm about to start the patient on azacitidine? Right, so I, I think as you mentioned exactly that the original you know, publication and the data set that was looked at were mostly patients untreated. When we looked at it, at least in our experience where we validated the revised IPSS, we did it at time of referral and it still was predictive for the outcome uh, for those patients. Uh, uh, the issue of whether they are dynamic or not is always something that comes up, but, but I think they do. And at least in our data set, the revised IPSS at time of referral uh, was still predictive for the outcome for those patients. Uh, I, I don't know the impact of the treatments on changing the prognosis for those patients as well as being just a you know, prognostic marker rather than predictive marker. So. It's only fair, though, to compare all those patients that had not gotten therapy to your point, so that way you can estimate you know, survival or leukemia evolution. But to your point, actually, when you think about 
uh, rate of progression that's never been addressed in any mm -hmm. of the scoring systems, which is why I think it's probably slightly overemphasized. To me, scoring systems are a great starting point. So choose one risk score and move on. You know? And as far as the rate of uh, progression is concerned, I don't think we know. It's, you know, it's a, it's a tough conundrum mm -hmm. because the, Rami referred to these systems not being dynamic, meaning we're, we're not sure how well they change in accuracy as a patient's disease evolves. They're, they're, they seem to be pretty good at time point zero. Mm -hmm. they, they probably are not as good at time point one and a half years. Okay. And, and we did do a study where we looked at patients who had been treated with hypomethylating agents, had those agents had failed those patients, and then we tried to apply the IPSSR or other prognostic scoring systems to those patients at that time, and in fact, they were not at all predictive of mm -hmm. outcome. Yeah, so we probably shouldn't be applying these after patients have been exposed to therapies for long periods of time, and certainly shouldn't be using them for clinical trial enrollment at that time. Agreed.